Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Cindy Cohen, Legal Director and General Counsel for the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Cindy has been at the forefront of maintaining online civil liberties by protecting Americans from unwarranted surveillance and wiretapping and strengthening online privacy, electronic voting, and other civil rights. In 2007, the National Law Journal named her as one of the 50 most influential women lawyers in the United States, and in 2010 she received the State Bar of California's Intellectual Property Vanguard Award. Founded in 1990, the Electronic Frontier Foundation works to extend the same civil liberties Americans have offline to their online activities. Cindy has generously agreed to share some of her experiences with us, and I'd like to thank you, Cindy, for joining us today. Thank you. So privacy, intellectual property, the issue of open access to information. Talk about the impetus for the founding of the Electronic Frontier Foundation and your work. They were founded in reaction to some raids that the Secret Service uh, was doing on people who are engaging in bulletin board activities. And bulletin board, just to remind everybody what that was, was about posting information in a, in a holding place where other people could also go and access it. That's right. I mean, it was a little like a chat room today, only much lower tech. If you've got a, a wall and Facebook, you've experienced something that was a, a little bit like uh, a bulletin board system, and it certainly serves the same purpose. It's a gathering place. There was an incident in which an AT&T document that in, was involved with the 911 system was leaked, and it was shared on one of these bulletin board systems. And the Secret Service um, overreacted pretty greatly. They raided a small uh, game company called Steve Jackson Games, and they basically took everything that was plugged into the wall um, and didn't really take the time like they would have to do in a physical search to try to figure out, well, what's important here and what's not important here. This fed into a discussion that some people were already having about how the constitutional rights of ordinary people were going to be challenged by these new technologies and, and how there really needed to be somebody in the vanguard to say, wait a minute, the same protections that you have in the offline world for free speech, for privacy, you know, assembly. Under, right to assembly, all of the, your constitution, all the Bill of Rights and, and, and laws should be translated into the, te the digital world in a way that makes sense for people and protects them. And so this particular incident sparked the creation of an organization to try to stand there, to try to be the, the, in the vanguard of thinking about these issues and really trying to steer both the law and the technology to a place of, of more freedom and more openness. Originally, the idea uh, for the foundation was to hire lawyers to defend some of the people who were involved in these raids. And, and what they discovered um, was that there weren't very many lawyers who understood much about the technology. And so the organization started hiring lawyers in-house. Now we have a dozen lawyers inside EFF and a large diaspora of lawyers outside EFF who we call on and who work with us on various issues. But in, in 1990, uh, uh, lawyers who really uh, understood and were thinking about digital technology and were in a position to defend constitutional rights in these new realms were very, very rare. So the technology evolves. The, the, the case law has not evolved. You have attorneys who uh, might be familiar with the case law that is based on, on old issues and now trying to apply them to, to new issues. Plus you have the whole uh, question of, of do you know how this technology actually functions and how search and seizure actually might function within this new context. That's exactly right. And, and part of what we do is try to serve as translators between judges and prosecutors and, and, and um, congressional staffers and other people in other branches of government and the technology to try to explain it and try to, try to, try to demonstrate like what are the analogs in the, in, the, in, the, in the real world that might work here, what's really new, what's not really new. Um, to try to just, in some cases, especially in the early days, just kind of damp down the hysteria around the technology and kind of get people to really think about what it's, what it's really doing and to think about the possibilities um, for how it can, you know, I mean, digital technologies have revolutionized freedom of speech, for instance, right? The First Amendment, um, you know, the old joke used to be the First Amendment uh, applies, you know, to people who own a printing press, right? Now we all own printing presses. Anybody can set up a, a website or a blog or even a Facebook page and get 
the interest of the world based upon the power of their ideas and their ability to convey them. Um, that's revolutionary, and it fulfills, I think, a dream of the Constitution uh, in a way that um, um, is, is wonderful and to be celebrated, but making sure that we, we maintain, we, we tell that story, that that story is part of what the courts are thinking about and what Americans are thinking about when they think about the new technologies and they, they recognize the, the way that the technologies can help you with your rights. On the privacy side, of course, now we're seeing issues where the technology really presents challenges for some of our, our rights as well. So for the casual user of these devices, we actually are engaged in free speech and that free speech, the right to that free speech and the right to privacy in that speech can be ameliorated uh, pretty um, dr dramatically uh, by, by many, many people. Also technology gives access to, um, to abuse. Yes, I think both are true, and the, the one of the founding principles of the EFF is um, is the idea that architecture is policy. The way your technology works and the way the technology is built is going to dictate what your rights are in it. So if you build a platform for free speech where anybody can type and anybody can write and speak, you're going to have a free speech platform. If you build a platform where you don't get to actually post to the internet until some third party intermediary has hit the OK button, mm -hmm. you're building a moderated thing for free speech. Privacy works the same way. We can build technologies that give us privacy, the little lock that comes on when you're purchasing something online. And well, that was one of EFF's early battles because the government didn't want there to be the ability for people to have private transactional information on the internet. The technology could be built either way. You could build the technology so that there is privacy, so that lock can turn on. The early internet browsers didn't have that lock, and so there wasn't an ability to have um, an encrypted channel, a protected, secure channel in that. And so architecture is policy. You can design a system so that you protect people's privacy or you don't protect their privacy. So you protect their free speech or you don't. The technology itself is pretty malleable. I mean, there's some things technology can't do. But we really live in an age where the, that that's pretty small. Um, technology can do a lot of things for us and so it really comes back to us. What choices are we going to make about the kind of technology we're going to build, about how the law interacts with that technology, um, and how we're going to use it. We have many technologies now that people use that really um, you know, where, where people have found uses for the technology that isn't what the technology's designer might, might have envisioned. Facebook's a great example of this. Facebook requires you to use your real name. Um, this is causing severe problems for people who are doing human rights activism around the world. And it's a policy decision, not a design decision. Facebook could do this either way. Once the street finds its uses for things, then we, we continue the dialogue. Is this facilitating freedom? Is this not facilitating freedom? Um, it's an ongoing discussion. And even features like personalization, if you have organizations that are collecting profiles on how we use the internet and making those personally identifiable so that when I sign on to Amazon, I get the books that I like, that intelligence can, because it's being collected and assembled, is now available for other people to tap into if Amazon uh, makes it freely available. Who owns that information about me? Generally, um, the law will say that Amazon owns that information about you. There's some exceptions to that. Um, and, and owns is kind of a funny term for this because it's not a physical piece well, of could property. Well, they, could they sell my information to somebody else? Generally, yes. Generally, yes. And what about my medical information? If I'm going now to a doctor and I'm, I, I'm um, getting examined, I've hired that doctor and they are collecting information about my genetic makeup and the conditions that I suffer, uh, do they own that information? Well, they, again, ownership is a funny concept here. There are specific laws about medical privacy. There's a law that was passed a few years ago called HIPAA that has a very clear rules about what a doctor can and can't do with the information that they collect about you. This is an area where the law has stepped in and said, we need to create really clear protections for this kind of information, medical information, because it's so sensitive. So if I uh, find that there are indicators after visiting my doctor for cancer, that might be protected. But if I go to Amazon and I buy a whole load of, of, of books on cancer, uh, that would not necessarily be protected. That's correct, and it would not be protected. And in fact, one of the things that we are working on now in the state of California is a reader privacy bill to try to 
um, ensure that that information is not available to law enforcement um, unless they get they go to a court and get a court order allowing them to have access to or it. To insurance companies or to other individuals well, or the, businesses? Well, the, the bill right now really just talks about uh, compelled disclosure to either law enforcement or in the context of a court case. Voluntary disclosure is something that I think um, the legislature wasn't willing to address just yet. So um, hopefully, eventually they will be, but we're going to try to get the piece we can get now and then think about the rest later. So if, if Amazon decided to voluntarily give your information to your insurance company, our law wouldn't reach that yet. We're, we're having to do this a step at a time. I think it, it comes as a surprise to people that uh, the information that they give to uh, any third party as part of the transaction that they're engaging in, really they don't have much of an int privacy interest in it anymore. And um, it's one of the areas where we've been working hard to try to update the law. The reader privacy bill is one. Um, nationally, we're part of a coalition called the Digital Due Process Coalition that's trying to update the communications privacy laws across the board and make sure that, you know, when you use Gmail or any other remote service. I mean, the, the buzzword now is cloud computing. Cloud but, computing. But, but cloud computing just means somebody else's computer. Uh, when you store things in someone else's computer or in the cloud, um, your right and your privacy interest in that information should remain the same. Uh, right now, the law doesn't protect that. The law, um, kind of based on some Supreme Court decisions from the 1970s, um, there is this doctrine called the third party doctrine that holds that if you give information to a third party, your privacy interest in it gets greatly reduced. Um, this is especially true about transactional information, who you're talking to and things like that, as opposed to content of your communications. This needs to be updated. Um, there is no, uh, you know, American people don't think that the difference between using um, a letter where the letter stays in their house or an email account where their email is popped down to their computer um, should be dramatically different than when they use Gmail or Hotmail in well, their privacy, since, but it is. Since the same cloud can contain information from Amazon and Facebook and Apple and um, your, your local municipality, now the information could, be, could theoretically be aggregated and used for completely unintended purposes. That's right. And so one of the big challenges, I think, is to try to regain that basic um, the basic protections for your information, whether you store it locally or you store it remotely, and and kind of align the law with what people's expectations are. I think people are surprised to learn that there might be a difference there. Um, you know, that doesn't mean there aren't some marketing purposes that might be okay, but right now we're in a situation in which I think people are not really understanding what's happening with this information. And um, that's not a good place for a democracy to be, right? People need to understand what's happening to their information so they can make informed decisions about what they want to do with it and, and pick and choose what laws they want to apply to it. And right now, I think we're in a situation in which both the technology and the sophistication of data manipulation on the back end have far outstripped most people's understanding of what's going on. And so we spend a lot of time trying to explain this. We do a lot of work. Uh, in the media and, and in our own website, kind of putting together videos and presentations to try to make sure that people understand what's happening. And um, on the consumer side, um, you know, on the, on the civil liberties side, we work to try to update the laws. On the consumer side, we're working um, on a proposal called Do Not Track, which is a um, setting that could be in your browser that would let you express your desire. If you want to be tracked, turn it off and they can track you but at least let you say what your preference is I don't want to be tracked um, that seems to us to be the starting point uh, for giving people control again and letting them express some choices because I think we've slid into a situation in which there's a their industry is being built based upon the fact that consumers don't know what's going on and don't have any say in it and and, and the first thing we need to do is give consumers a voice again what other areas are, are you involved in, and, and what type of cases have, uh, have the Electronic Frontier Foundation uh, advanced that affects our daily lives? Well, um, the, the earliest one that I was involved in is the cryptography case, the one that I mentioned about the little lock on your yes. browser. When we started, the government controlled cryptography like a munitions, like a surface-to-air missile or a tank. 
Um, it was clear to us that if, if the digital world was going to thrive and people especially were going to be able to do commerce online, buy and sell things, but also have a private conversation. And so we were involved in a lawsuit and a, and a broader public campaign to try to free up uh, cryptography from control, and, and we ultimately won. And, and, and um, cryptography now has uh, certain kinds of cryptography have very light government control, but most of the stuff that people want to use every day um, that you, they can implement secure uh, technologies that the rest of us can all enjoy. So um, that was an early case. We've been involved in a lot of cases around the search and seizure laws and trying to get those updated, and, and those continue today. Uh, we, uh, the government had maintained in a, in a case um, called Warshak that we were amicus in, um, that if you left email on the server of your ISP for more than six months, um, they didn't need a warrant anymore to get access to it. And we were uh, able to help uh, get the court, the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeal, to say, no, that's wrong. You, you, you need a, government needs a warrant if they're going to go walking through your email. And the fact that you've got email sitting at Gmail or some service for more than six months does not mean that you've abandoned it. Uh, yes. You're using that as a storage facility and that, that needs, it needs to be protected. So. The search and seizure stuff started from the very first case we did um, and continues today. Um, there's a lot of work we're doing around location privacy and when the government needs a warrant in order to get uh, your cell phone company to give them ongoing information about where you where are. You are. Um, and other technologies, but you know, we all now walk around with, with phones and the phones are constantly uh, pretty much constantly know where we are because they need to route our calls. Uh, um, that's great. We want to be able to have that technology, but we need the law to protect it better. And we're spending a lot of time in the courts and in Congress trying to make, make bring those protections up to what people are doing now. Um, we've done a lot of work around uh, wiretapping. Mm -hmm. um, in the you know the Bush administration, it was uh, revealed that the government was warrantlessly wiretapping Americans. Uh, the president admitted it on TV, um, and there's been a, a series of lawsuits around that um, and trying to reinstall the rule of law around surveillance. And famously, this, this case now with uh, Murdoch's, uh, yes. Rupert Murdoch's organization um, tapping into the phones um, and private correspondence of, of bereaved relatives uh, and, and others affected by, uh, by terrorism. It's just a, a hideous uh, circumstance. Yes, and it... I think it points out two things that need to happen. One is I think our technologies need to protect us better. Back to architecture as policy. Our voicemail systems and our cell phone systems really didn't have, don't have very good security. Um, the companies that provide this to us need to do better, and they can. It's a cost-saving measure for them, um, and it's time for them to step up the plate and give us technologies that protect us Well, the situation better. with Sony where you had uh, hackers come in and were able to penetrate the network to such an extent, Sony's network, now it was criminal activity, but they were able to penetrate the network to such an extent that the privacy and the financial security of so many individuals were, were completely compromised. Our tools can protect us better, and, uh, and, and companies really need to. We're, we're involved in several projects, tech projects, to try to make the internet more secure. Uh, one is called uh, HTTPS Everywhere, uh, when you type a website, you go to http colon slash slash www dot blah blah blah. It's a, the language of the internet. Creating HTTPS is a secure way to browse where you have much more assurance that you're actually getting to the website that you think you're getting to and that nobody's intercepting it in between. And it's a security standard that's been around for a long time. And so we built a plugin that goes on your Firefox browser that will automatically make sure that you're connected via this protocol in as many different websites as you can in a secure way. So we're pushing companies to make things more secure. We're actually building tools to help make you more secure online. Um, but we also need to update the law. I mean, the, the, the sense that, that kind of pervades this British story about the hacking that Everybody does this. It's easy. It's simple, um, and it's it's okay. It's you know people shouldn't expect to have any privacy anymore. Um, uh, you know we need to really combat that. People people deserve privacy. Um, you know I know we live in this age where um, people are able to share more information right. than they've ever been able to share. But I think there's been a sense among certain um, folks and, and certainly some business interests. That that means that people don't want privacy anymore, and I, that's that's dead wrong. And when you see the reaction to what's happened in 
the British situa situation, I think you realize the difference between wanting to be able to choose to share more and wanting to not have that choice and have people just decide that you don't have any privacy anymore. A lot of these, these technologies are intersecting now. So intellectual property in digital form, when you can digitize the genome, it begs the question as to whether uh, an organization like the Elect Electronic Frontier Foundation starts getting involved. Well, we haven't gotten involved in the genome stuff yet. Um, I suspect that we will at some point. Um, we have been involved in some of the gathering of DNA that the government's been doing and the growth in the try to use DNA tracking um, through family members and everything else to try to use the kind of the capabilities of, of, of DNA evidence to try to um, empower law enforcement to be able to, uh, to track people better and to, to frankly get away from the traditional investigative types and instead just um, kind of trying to use, rely a little more too heavily on the technology to try to um, narrow down uh, who suspects might be. You leave DNA everywhere you go. Right. Um, and so if there. that's open season for the government to track us, then we don't have to worry about national ID cards anymore. We've got something much more dangerous about tracking us. And I, I think there's a risk to our society in becoming too easily fingerprinted, um, digitally fingerprinted and tracked. Well, one can imagine um, having just uh, taken a sip from this glass, having um, my local insurance company come up and, and collect my DNA and analyze it and eventually being able to uh, define which conditions I am predisposed to suffer over the next several years and adjusting my insurance automatically based on the, on the proposition that I left my DNA, I abandoned my DNA, it no longer belongs to me and, and they can do with it whatever, the, whatever they wish. Now there is a federal law that would prevent something that, that direct. Um, but, and there are some state laws as well that are beginning to, to challenge with that. But there's a lot more subtler scenarios that I think we're going to start seeing and I think it's important to try to be ahead of the curve on some of, some of that stuff. Um, you know, in a slightly different vein, we're beginning to see a lot more ability by the government to do um, mass surveillance, uh, mass wiretapping, uh, mass mapping of our communications um, uh, networks, um, so who talks to who talks to who kinds of things. Um, the NSA is building a, a, you know, a, a massive facility in the desert in Utah, I think it's, I don't know how many football fields long, just to store all the data that they are collecting, um, some of which is about us. And um, it's another area where we're really seeing the advances in digital technology allow for a level of intrusion into our lives that, that really the government just couldn't do um, until now. So theoretically the government could at a certain point track everybody that I've ever talked with. Yes. And everybody that I have called in the last month, every purchase I've made, um, every book that I've read. That's right. And you know that that then you begin to really need the checks and balances of the system, right? I mean, one of the things we've learned as a country is that, you know, absolute power corrupts absolutely. And if you give too much power uh, to anybody uh, without proper checks and balances, you're going to see abuses of that power. And when we have those. You know, we have the, the FBI, you know, wiretapping Martin Luther King and John Lennon. And, you know, uh, we, we have plenty of examples of abuses of, the power, of power, even in, you know, much more recent memory. And um, so once the government has this technical ability, we need to think seriously as a society about, well, what are the checks and balances we're going to put? Are we just going to trust that they would, you know, it would never be misused against an innocent person? That the Trust the powerful not to exercise the power. Right. And in a way, you know, whether that's in a political framework, um, you know, we have knocked down, drag out politics in this country. And the idea that those, those things would never be misused in a political matter, I think, would be naive um, against disfavored groups. Um, uh, we've already had scan, uh, you know, scandals of, of law enforcement trying to penetrate groups that were doing environmental organizing, um, organizing uh, minority groups, religious minorities. Um, we, we have a long and, and, and somewhat sad history of this. Um, now we're giving technological tools on steroids to those same branches of government without you know, and, and it's time to start thinking about what the checks and balances really need to look like. And unfortunately, you know, the pendulum has really swung in favor of um, law enforcement and national security agencies uh, without corresponding oversight. 
by Congress or by internal investigators or by the court systems, the ability to access the courts if you've been misused, which is something we've been trying to do for a long time with the warrantless wiretapping. Um, it, we really need to, I think, as a society, decide, do we, do we want to keep the checks and balances uh, um, that, that the founders set up, or are we really willing to throw them overboard? And, and if we're going to throw them overboard, don't you think we should have some discussion about that, as opposed to just ceding authority to, uh, uh, to, to the folks who, who claim to be trying to protect us? Important issues for any of us who have, uh, who have typed on a keyboard, who have spoken on a cell phone, who have spoken um, in, in any of our devices, communicated through any of our devices that are so ubiquitous today. Uh, Cindy Cohen, thank you so much for sharing your experience with us, and thank you for your insights. Thank you.